this is kind of a, a really fun presentation for me um, because of the crowd. I, I typically speak before politicians, um, a lot of folks that don't really get into this stuff. Let's see, make sure I've got this up. And I, I really want to thank um, Esri for having me here. Um, in particular, I want to thank John Harrison, uh, Christian Carlton from the, um, the Charlotte office, uh, Chris, Chris Witkins for helping us with the model, for doing, we're going to get into some uh, city engine, uh, uh, Brooks, Brooke Pat Patrick's, Jack for his vision for all of this, um, and also definitely Shannon, um, who I feel like has become sort of a groupie. Um, I've seen you at several conferences uh, talking about this stuff, and I get excited about this work. But when I started going here, I, I really had this kind of flashback to the GSD, and I kind of had this really strange anxiety. I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to be in front of Carl. Um, so I, I kind of dug out my design with nature and dug back into it uh, to make sure that I, I got it right. And what was fascinating um, getting into it is going back and looking at it with, with career experience and re-investigating McCard. And one of the things that's kind of amazing is the things that he talks about that I wasn't conscious of in grad school. And I just want to read these, this, this quote, the objective of an improved method should incorporate resource values, social values, aesthetic values, in addition to the normal criteria of physiographic traffic and engineering considerations. He goes on to say the word value 300, or, uh, 364 times in this book. Think about that. What is value? How do we determine value? What are the values that we talk about in our community? Um, so I'm, that's kind of my investigation. It's my challenge to you all to talk about this. And I'm from Asheville. Who's, who's been to Asheville in this audience? Oh, wow. That's a lot of people. So Asheville is your kind of typical little town of 80,000 people up in the beautiful mountain settings of um, the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, we're the home of bluegrass. We've got 20, 20 breweries. Uh, we're on a brewery per capita basis. We're about 5,000 people per brewery at this point. Um, we have men that dress as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. So it's a typical place in the South. This is kind of how it operates. Um, the firm that I used to work with is a real estate development firm that was founded by this man here, Julian. Julian Price uh, moved to Asheville with um, a fortunate inheritance. Um, he used that money in a philanthropic way, but one of the things that was kind of key that he did is he birthed a real estate development company to focus on rehab and, build and fixing downtown. So I was fortunate enough to have a position there as the new projects director uh, working for Pat Whalen, who would use the methods to make this realization happen. So 75% of our money goes into the sticks and bricks. Um, we fix buildings. You see them all here. We do 25% of our money. We seed entrepreneurs. We get businesses going in the ground floors, like the first vegetarian restaurant that a bank wouldn't loan money to. So that's kind of what we were doing at a ground level. And we were doing it. Um, in a, in a pool of resistance. Our downtown had been forgotten about, the people that were there, uh, there was a resistance moment not to go back to that downtown. Don't do that here, we'll never go back down that road of urbanism. Um, our de facto motto was that will never work here, don't even try. Um, so these are, this is what downtown looked like. This is, uh, this is one of our buildings before and after. Uh, upper story apartments, um, bookstore, restaurant in the, in the ground floor. Those apartments are four to 600 square foot units. We were told they would never work. They've been 99% leased up ever since. We basically followed the rules of urbanism to make the projects happen. The other thing that was interesting about Julian, he's since passed away, but he's, uh, he, he was kind of an activist and um, he had his own magazine. And I love this quote in his magazine. Uh, and again, he's trying to educate the citizens about what the importance of cities are. Uh, and I'll, I'll read you all this quote. Among cities with no particular recreation appeal, those that have preserved their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourism simply doesn't go to a city that has no soul. Right? Just let those words wash over you for a second. Interestingly enough, he quoted Arthur Frommer in 1993, 15 years after he passed away. Frommer's magazine would list us as the number five place in the country to visit. This year, we were, we were listed as the number one place in the, in the country to visit by Frommer's magazine. This is what the change of your community can bring for you. Now, that's all fine and good. How do you communicate to people that are at both ends of the spectrum? On the right, they don't like downtown. On the left, uh, you know, all developers are evil. How do you communicate to them? For us, we take an agnostic approach, and we just give them the data. So we've kind of moved into a new direction of going away from the print media, and PowerPoint is our weapon of choice in our community. Um, 
And first, I'm going to start with a little test here. Um, so for those of you that have actually seen me present, no shouting out this answer, but I'm going to give you uh, about five seconds to take a look at this kid's puzzle that I'm about to show you and tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. So for those of you that have seen this before, no, no shouting out the answers, but for the rest of you, this should, uh, an articulate crowd should be able to figure this out. So tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. Ready, go. Is that the statistics guy? Okay, 40, we had 42 was a quick answer. Who, who else, Any, anybody higher or lower? Five, seven, eight. Anybody wanna go higher than 42? Lower than eight? How many kids were on the school bus? Anyone? What time was it on the clock? See, you have to realize at the end of the day, we're an irrational being. We're, we're a species that operates in an irrational way. But we're, we have these tricks, these behavioral mechanisms that make us survive. I just used one against you. I gave you a question. The questions that we ask steer the reality that we look at. You didn't see the five kids on the bus. You didn't see that it was 10 after 10 because I didn't ask you that question. When we're doing city design, when we're talking about cities, when we're talking about communities, what we put as a value starts at the question that we ask and that's how you got to get people to see that. Do you see, do you see what I'm talking about? So what I want to challenge you with is what is a city? That's my question. And for me, a city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. It's essentially a farm, right, that grows a crop of buildings. So there's a cash flow behind all of that that works with going on in the city. So my task here is to explain that cash flow. Um, incidentally, you can probably tell that I voted for Robin yesterday um, in his presentation. So back to what cities are, this is straight out of, out of uh, Oxford Dictionary. Incorporate, constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. We're all shareholders in these corporations. Our company is a $12 million shareholder in a $14 billion corporation. I'm a $250,000 shareholder just out of my neighborhood. So my community is worth, is worth $12 billion. If Asheville were in the stock market, it would be worth three times the Donald. Did y'all get that? So that's what my community is. Think about your community. So if we think about the products that we're growing, this the buildings. Um, this is one of our buildings that we rehab. We took it on the chin because the, the city came in and did a streetscape project, uh, and we were accused, our development company was accused of being subsidized for having a garbage can, a bike rack, two benches, and a street tree, right? About $20,000 worth of investment at our front door. We'll go ahead and own it. Thank you, city, for giving us a gift. We took this building for $300,000 of tax value up to $11 million. That represents a 3,500% tax hit for us to do the right thing, right? We could look at that as a tax penalty, or we could say our community can now afford 3,500% more stuff. You want to build a bike lane? You want, to, you want to do any work? Great. It's a community gift. We're growing community wealth. And people say to me, like, well, Joe, that's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here that's worth $20 million. Double our building's value. Okay, fine. Here's the Walmart. This is our building. This is my house. That's my wife, Caroline. These are my two dogs. They think they're lions. Uh, <laughs> they're very weird dogs, by the way. It's interesting living with a behaviorist. But um, so, you know, Caroline and I pay $2,000 in taxes. We're on a tenth of an acre, right? Walmart pays $220,000 in property taxes. Well, these are apples and oranges. How do we make them apples to apples? Well, if I had a one acre cookie cutter that just fell from space, and landed in my neighborhood, it's gonna grab 10 houses, right? Y'all follow me? We're all paying $2,000 in taxes or $20,000 an acre in taxes. Take that same one acre cookie cutter, fly it into space, drop it on the Walmart, $221,000 divided by 34 is 6,500. Now if you had an acre of our building, this is what you get. Now I wanted to make this real simple for y'all. This is California, this joke may work. <laughs> if I had an acre of land to grow something here, what are you gonna grow? And you go for the cash crop, right? It's real simple. So I know y'all are saying, well, that's fine, Joe, that's property taxes, what about retail tax? Everybody's chasing retail. All right, let's get rid of me and Caroline because we don't sell anything. Now the misnomer is we chase the wrong number. We're looking at this and going, wow, $77 million worth of sales there. Now again, that's over 34 acres. The other thing is the city only gets a portion of a portion of that. 
pull the numbers on it, you're getting this, which is a bigger number than the city's property tax, or a total nut of $51,000 an acre of total taxes coming out of that Walmart. Go out to our, look at the property taxes on our building, add the retail taxes, you're cooking with gas, jobs per acre, I mean, how do you all want to look at it? When you put the data and the numbers side by side, the choice is pretty clear what you're going to go for. Did you all get this? So how do, we, how do we articulate this in the community? Well, that's just the city side. There's also a county nut that comes with this too because the city sits on top of this other corporation called the county. So just doing the math on this, we see the city resident on average is a greater contributor of county taxes per acre than a county resident. Incidentally, we like to pick on the Biltmore Estate and their lovely uh, tax break that they have here, but that's an inside joke for Asheville. Um, America's biggest house needs the biggest tax break. But Getting into um, <laughs> Asheville Mall, this is why a politician might choose the mall, right? You see the county taxes to the mall versus residential. What a good deal. Y'all follow me? Let's go into the downtown because the downtown's paying county taxes too. This is our building and county taxes versus the mall. So what we found is what's good for downtown is great for the city, but it's unbelievable for the county. This isn't scary math that I'm doing here. I, I don't have a finance degree, I have, a, I have an urban design degree and an architecture degree. Just digging into the numbers and looking at this and taking that chance of asking that question, a new reality emerges. And what we're doing is we're comparing things and making land the efficient value on a per unit basis. Now we do this, we do this with cars, right? If we were all to compare these cars and say, what's the miles per tank, well we'd all be driving Ford F-150s. But you know the lunacy in that because everybody's got a different tank size. Right? So we do it on a per gallon basis because that gasoline's a finite commodity and it makes the, the cars on an efficiency basis, miles per gallon, different question, different numbers, different results. The Piazzetta, the 19, sorry for the Prius owners in this audience, but the 1955 Isetta gets 70 miles per gallon. Y'all follow me? So we did, we've done this all across the country from, North, we've actually done uh, several, uh, uh, California towns, um, the numbers that we see, taking all of that data and mashing it up, for every dollar of county taxes a county resident pays per acre to the county, a city resident's paying about five bucks, the Walmart's about six bucks, the mall's about nine. As soon as you get to a two-story building, what you see is not a proportional growth, but an exponential growth. That value is there, we're just not reflecting it. So just breaking down the humble rules of, of or the relentless rules of humble arithmetic, to quote Chief Justice Brandeis, the math will show you what's going on. So I'll, I'll run through an example. We did some work in Sarasota, Florida. Um, I have with me uh, Joshua McCart McCarty, who works with, works with me in all of this, and it's kind of the, the magician behind a lot of this work, so he's here to talk with us about it later. Um, in Sarasota, if I were a developer building this godforsaken place, this is actually somewhere in Arizona, but let's just stick with me here. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm building this, I've got soft costs and hard costs. I, build it, I keep a ledger of all of those costs, and I divide it by the rooftops, add my profit, there I go, right? That's, that's development. When the government gets this thing plugged onto the street, do they do the same thing? Anybody got an answer to that? It's no. They don't. They send out an assessor to say, what's it worth? They put a percentage on top of it, and that's how they do government. But if they were to do the cost and say, what's our service costs, what's our hard cost, the roads to get out here, what does it cost me as a corporation to service your development and I'm going to bill you appropriately? That seems like simple logic, right? I'm not the first person to come onto this idea. It actually goes back to this guy um, with this document. 19, 1973, the Nixon administration published this, the cost of sprawl document. Did you all know that? Well, some of you did, yeah. <laughs> Carl. Um, <laughs> interesting they didn't teach us to this at the, at the urban design department. You should let Krieger know about that. Um, so in Florida, they actually they did a, a localized version. This is James Duncan, uh, did this, this report for the state. Basically costing out from downtown to the burbs. We took a couple of examples here. Again, this is really quick math that we did for them. Grab downtown, grab the suburban environment. We went out to the suburbs, grab some multifamily, 357 units. So I said, let's do an apples to apples comparison. Taking the same number of units, we went into downtown, pulled out 357 units, and let's run the math on this. So from a land consumption standpoint, the downtown is in the dark green, the suburban is in the light green. You consume one-tenth the land area for the same number of units. From a government perspective, it costs me 57% as much in infrastructure, 
Yeah, we just went right into the taxes, just went right to the assessor's files, pulled them, ran the numbers. We were making 870% more money out of the downtown stuff versus the burbs, right? So if this is my mortgage, and this is Josh's, this is my annual payment, this is Josh's, how long will it take the two of us to pay off our mortgages at that rate? It takes me 42 years, it takes Josh three. Now the dirty little secret here is the street only lasts 35 years. So Josh, I haven't even made it through my payment period before I need more infrastructure from you all. Did you all get that? But in real estate development world, when I have cost, revenue, and time, I can do an ROI, what's my return rate on this investment as a public corporation. It's basically an 18% return, return rate for the downtown stuff. You're not even achieving inflation with the suburban environment. I was presenting this in Idaho, and there were people like, Joe, look, these are way too many charts for us. Just kind of make it simple. You're 20. What does it look like? This is what it looks like at the municipal coffers. You've essentially produced $34 million worth of wealth with the urban environment. You're still in the whole $5 million bucks with the suburban pattern. Did you all get that? Got awfully quiet. Um, I'll make maps, trust me, we'll get there. <laughs> going, going back to McCarg, I mean, read this, this is incredible. We have, one, we have but one explicit model of the world and that is built upon economics. Money is our measure. He said it. So how do you map that? So when you look at the city, we can put the city aside and we can strip out the layers, right? We can do what we've, what we've done, we can map the infrastructure, the buildings that come onto the infrastructure, and then we can do the ologies. We can do hydrology, geology, right? What we specialize in is basically getting in the middle of all of this stuff and looking at the policies and mapping the tax productivity. We show the map of the finances, we map the money for the whole entire region. So this, this is an old concept. This is original Geo Design 101 right here back I think we're going back more than 100 years to 1748 to Jim Battista Noli, where he made a tax map of Rome. In urban design school, we're trained about the open space as a figure ground, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, they're taxing people on the black stuff and not taxing people on the white stuff. And immediately, right away, if anybody's ever been to Rome to Palazzo Farnese, I can't walk into that courtyard. They're not being taxed on it. It's essentially a privatized gift from the government. It's one way to look at the map that you can see finance and financial and policy decisions writ large in a figure ground. Did y'all follow me? So we did the analysis in Austin, Texas. Um, this is their mile per tank map. Um, and by the way, if anybody wants copies of this, we'll just give you a PDF of it. Um, this is the way that politicians typically look at the county. Again, this is the county map. So you see these really p uh, potent, expensive properties out here, but they're huge properties, that's not fair. Let's go back and do the mile per gallon or the value per acre map. This is the map changes. And when we go to the community, we don't even bother with this. We get through the maps. You all can read maps. But for the communities, we do this. We just, uh, you know, this is going into arc scene and basically doing an extrusion. And I just ask the audience, I'm, can you, well, I'll ask you. Can you all tell me where downtown is? <laughs> That's it. That's all you have to do. So uh, Josh is a big fan. We're all, we're all map nerds, by the way. Um, Josh brought in the, the cartogramming method. Uh, this is actually pretty fun too, so this is a, a, good, a good thing to show you all. Uh, you all know what a cartogram is, it's two-dimensional distortion of value, right? So New York is the number one uh, energy seller in 1921, so it's the number one importance. California is number three, it's one-third the size. So going into doing the value per acre is a cartogram distortion, this is how it looks. So basically, downtown, it takes up that much area, but financially inside the wealth of the community, it's like a one to 72 relationship getting people to see the value that's there right in, front, right in front of them, hiding in plain sight, right? So the other fun thing is uh, we actually got our hands on other uh, tax flow data, and, and this is Travis County, Austin's in the center, this is a six county area. This is the booze sales for Austin. Um, for those of you that are from Austin, it was really interesting when I pointed out this district, they were really proud of their drinking habit, um, almost as much as downtown. But you see downtown popping off the map. That's just mixed beverage sales. Hotel sales, again, who's the big breadwinner here? Retail sales. I was blown away by this. Now what's interesting is, check out that. This is, this is the six county area, and because the model got so huge when we got into retail tax, we had to distort the model to shrink it down to one half the width. 
but that's downtown. These are the mall areas. So even though they're pretty much a 100% land use of retail, where downtown has city uh, residential, office buildings, non-taxable stuff, downtown is still the producer in this. It's the breadwinner visually, and when you add all of them together. Now let's run through a couple of examples. So here are your usual suspects. We've got the Walmart at about $800,000 an acre, the Power Center at about 1.2 million, and then the mall at about 2 million, right? Compare that with the downtown, this is intense, 108 million. Again, we'll, we have the Walmart at 800,000. And then this is stunning, $487 million an acre of value. Like we've seen cities that have less value than this one building. This is 620 times the tax potency of a Walmart, that one building. That's another way to look at value. What we found interesting in, in Austin is the value of history, the value of those buildings that culturally we know who we are, the buildings you'd put on a postcard, right? This is a building right here built in 1912. There's horses running around. This thing's like 100 years old. And here it is at $60 million an acre of value. And again, the Walmart at 800000 Which one's going to be here 100 years from now? This building or the Walmart? You know the answer to that, right? So this building's been there in the environment, producing that value, something that they cherish and put on postcards, and it's been a high producer inside their portfolio. It's continued to give wealth to the community, and that's the cash flow. Or this building here, which is over 100 years old, built in 1886, still at $67 million an acre. You don't have to be a tall building to produce wealth. So running their cash flow, extruding out some of the, the objects in the model, here's the Walmart, here's the average city single family resident producing more county tax revenue than the Walmart. As soon as you get into downtown, the mixed use buildings, it starts taking off. Here's the big breadwinner over here at about $2.4 million of county taxes per acre, county taxes. It also pays a city increment and a business improvement district increment. Here's the average of downtown at about $100,000 of cash flow. So if I had 1.8 acres of this building here, the, the Stephen F. Austin, I'd equal the 172 acre power center and ta property tax productivity. When we look at the footprint on the land of what we consume versus what we get back, I can consume a heck of a lot less land and still get the same revenue as that. Do you all get that? Or 1.1 acres of the BD Riley's produces the 20-acre Walmart. So people have asked me, they're like, well, Joe, that's fine. You know, people like suburban development. That's what they want. And it, it kind of made me sound, uh, think of the uh, uh, Christmas Carol with the ghost of Christmas future. What if somebody built an entire county of suburban, low-rise, low-density development. And we got our, our case. Josh and I were working on uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia. If anybody knows Gwinnett County, Georgia, it's uh, northeast of Atlanta. I mean, they seriously told me, they're like, look, we're rural people in Gwinnett County. We're not city people. I was actually asked during my report to not use the word urban, city, town, or municipal in my conversation. And I was like, all right. And we, 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 we were like, whatever you think you are, that's great. Lawrenceville is the county seat at 30,000 people, and we pulled their data, we're like, okay, well, y'all are 800,000 people in your county, and I'm just from a town of 80,000 people. I'm like, you're 10 times our size, you're huge. Like, no, no, we're rural. We're 460 square miles, Joe, we're big. So on a per mile basis, Gwinnett County is about 1,900 people per square mile, which is less than DeKalb County, which is where Atlanta is. So okay, I'll give you that, you're less dense than DeKalb. But what's crazy is we went into our data set and we pulled the numbers and did the math. And when I was presenting to the community, I said, I was like, I got this one question for y'all. Y'all are 1,900 people per square mile, which is 200 people per square mile denser than Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. What's in Mecklenburg County? Charlotte. I'm like, how the hell did you guys get denser than Charlotte without making a Charlotte or a Nashville or an Austin or a Raleigh or an Asheville or heck, not even a Chapel Hill? This is mind blowing to me. Can you all tell me that? Like, how could you do that? And so Josh did the model, and I was just like, holy cow. It's just like, that's all I can see is yellow. And I was like, usually I see a spot. I can tell where downtown is or the city is. So he, I was like, Josh, turn the model around. So he kind of, you know, leaned it on its side and then flat. And I was like, this is just like a big, thick carpet <laughs> through the whole thing. <laughs> and that was their choice. This is their policy choice, right? This is what we typically see. Can you tell me where downtown Ch Chapel Hill, downtown Carborough, or even downtown Hillsborough is? I can see downtown, downtown, Main Street. 
in all of these models. They didn't have a spike. So, I don't know, this is maybe just a little bit egregious, but just to rub it in a little bit, we're like, okay, so y'all are pulling a whopping $8 million an acre is your highest value in your entire community. These places are all less dense, right? <laughs> so to put the models side by side by side on the table and look at Nashville, Austin, and Lawrenceville, and we, we call this our economic heart monitor, we're like, let's check your pulse. So this is how it looks. <laughs> and Nashville's pulling 192 million an acre, Austin's pulling 476, and I'm like, y'all are flatlining at eight. Did y'all get this? These are conscious decisions they're making of their own community wealth and what they're harvesting. So we have to make it so that people can measure this stuff, they can see it. And uh, to take that to the final extreme, in Chattanooga we were doing a study, here's their downtown, this is their hipster area across the river, their Brooklyn um, over there, and this developer from Atlanta was proposing a, wall, uh, uh, a public grocery store, which is a regional chain. Typical suburban design, flat, flat parking lot box, right? Here's the site. We've already got ingredients of urbanism happening here. We've got mixed-use buildings. We've got the local guy did a kind of a local version of Whole Foods over here. We've got townhouses. We've got the, the ingredients, right? We've got Publix. We've got comps in the marketplace. We pulled their data. It was already sitting there. We've got the mixed-use buildings. We pulled their data. And here's the local Green Life grocery store with a liner building in front of it. Publix has done crazy stuff in other markets, so we pulled theirs too. This is in Miami Beach, where you literally drive up onto the roof. This is a conveyor belt to get you to the, to the parking. Uh, it looks like a UFO hit it, by the way. Look at this. Boom. Um, this is a small footprint Publix grocery store parking lot. It's got two doors. It's got a door on the street and a door in the parking lot. Here's the site, 34 foot of grade change. I'm going to apologize for my graphics here on this one because I built this. Um, and you can see I haven't mastered the art of a tin. Um, so, it's a GIS joke. Um, but here you can see uh, the Publix with its retaining wall, right? Oh, incidentally, we're running the taxes, but I'll come back to this in a second. What we wanted to show the community is that all of these housing units could now look at this tarmac of a roof, and we've got our quarter mile long future graffiti wall right here. Um, <laughs> just, that's what you're getting. We just want you to see it. Here are some other options. Urban Design 101, let's put housing facing housing, let's put a couple corner buildings, let's call it a day. Boom, this is what you get. Now let's design the site a little bit. Let's do what the local, local guy did. Let's move it up against the street, give it a liner building, ring the site, do a belly of parking. Boom. Um, do, go crazy. Do Miami Beach, drive up on the roof, ring the whole site, densify the heck out of it. That. And then back it down to West Palm Beach, smaller footprint. And then Let's assume you've frustrated the developer, the developer goes back to Atlanta, and you unfortunately get what's already happening in the neighborhood, which is townhouses and mixed-use buildings. That's what you get. Okay? So let's run the taxes. This is what you're currently getting out of the site. This is what the developer's proposing, which is a three times gain in your community revenue. This is with the 101 design and what you get. This is with the better site design and what you get on an annual basis. Going crazy and doing Miami Beach, backing it down to West Palm Beach, in a no-build scenario. What gives you the most wealth in your community? These are decisions as an elected official you have to make. So we'll go ahead and choose two um, and kind of zoom in for a second. And, and uh, Chris Wilkins, thank you. You helped us with City Engine. Just to kind of make it look better and see, and I love that Chris painted it all red, the big scar in the landscape. Um, but you can see how these work out. Again, here's the cash flow. So let's think about these things. What's crazy is this is the annual contribution. When this decision happens, y'all are living with it for 20 years, right? That, that grocery store doesn't disappear the next year. You're stuck with it. It's going to amortize this way out for at least 20 years. So we're going to run those numbers over a 20-year NPV. Again, thank you, Robin, for uh, explaining that yesterday. So we're talking about $5 million versus $900,000. That's the community's decision. This is the opportunity cost. Heck, let's go out and give the developer $2 million bucks to make it happen you'd still be ahead $2.2 million at the end of the day. Did y'all follow me? So when we make these decisions, what we're consciously saying is, we want this environment, we're not gonna have the cash flow to support doing a new greenway, we don't want the art teacher, and we're not gonna have a dancing cop. Did y'all follow me? <laughs> it's when communities don't have the budget, it's because of the accretion of all these decisions that I, as a developer in your marketplace, are doing to undermine your economy. These are behavioral tricks built into the system. 
and I'm just following the game. Did y'all follow that? I'll show you how distorted the marketplace is. This is one of our favorite maps. This is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We've got building value and we've got dirt value, right? We go into the computer and just turn off the building value and just look at the dirt value per acre. Did y'all follow me? Just the dirt. Don't care about anything else. You expect the world to look like this. Everybody's got the same value per acre, right? Me and all my neighbors have the same dirt value on a per square foot, per inch, per acre basis. You immediately, with this map, start to see the anomalies in the mathematics that the assessors use. They don't do geoanalytics this way. If they just did one map, they'd immediately see it, right? But putting that aside, I pointed this out. And I was talking to the community, and I was like, hey, what's going on here where that's $15,000 an acre, and when you cross the street, it doubles in value to $35,000 an acre? The tax assessor was sitting in the front row, and she raises her hand. And this is in front of the entire community. And I, I asked her, I said, ma'am, what's, what's the issue? She goes, you don't understand. And I said, what don't I understand? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the, the, lower the value. <laughs> the mayor just about spat coffee through his nose. It was really kind of funny. Everybody in the room laughed. I was like, really? I can have three quarters of a mile of a street here, three quarters of a mile of a street here, another half mile and half mile. I've got three miles of your infrastructure. I've got the biggest site, which probably means I've got the biggest capacity. I can put the most stuff on the site, right? My planning director would probably agree that more stuff means more commerce. More commerce means more trips. More trips means more accidents. I get more firefighters dedicated to my building. I don't have to pay for it. I got more commerce, more theft, more police calls. I don't have to pay for it. So you're going to give me a discount because I happen to have the biggest property. She's like, yeah, that's our standard. I asked her, I said, so where'd you get the standard from, by the way? <laughs> You know, just to tell you what a nerd I am, I presented this at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers. I got the same response from the audience. They're like, we have no idea where it came from. And I said, well, who knows? And they're like, well, you should probably talk to Larry Clark. I'm like, really, Larry? They're like, yeah. So I go talk to Larry, and he's like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. This is what happens inside the way that we, take, we design cities. We just have to ask that question. These aren't invisible market forces steering me as a developer to do something. These are all policies that direct me, and sometimes for unintended consequences. So what's crazy to me is we should have seen this coming. We've already just gone through it. Why did the recession happen? Why aren't we doing anything different now than we did 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And, and this is the Atlantic out of 1920. They got it right. Leverage was not the problems. Incentives were and still are. We still have to deal with these things, and I think it's the challenge of our profession as geo-designers. If we want to move the, the mouse, we have to move the cheese. So just to close, for those of you that are from Redlands, y'all are worth $7.3 billion. If you were a sports team, you'd be worth more than all of the Los Angeles sports teams combined, right? Or, put it a little bit closer to home, you're about 3.3 .3 Clippers. Um, <laughs> and don't you think Steve Ballmer knows what Blake Griffin's towel bill is? Of course. I can tell you the cups in our nightclub cost five cents a cup. We had to do the math to go from three cents a cup to five cents a cup because we wanted to go from plastic cups to, to corn-based corn soybean, or soybean cups. Did y'all get that? We do the math to understand the business. We have to understand the decisions of what's going on. And um, you know, in preparing for this, this is when I usually, I usually stop, but uh, Jack said something very interesting last, last year that really stuck with me. And, um, and he said, if you put it on a map, people get it quickly. We've seen this time and time again when we make those three-dimensional models of the taxes. People get it. They understand what's going on at the bigger level. And I really think we need a new bumper sticker uh, for our office, maybe saying, do the map. So uh, <laughs> thank you for your time. <laughs>